Hello and uh, welcome to our third of three events around marine anti-fouling. Um, I'm Will Green, I work for the National Biofilms Innovation Centre. I'd like to start off by apologising for the short notice cancellation last week. There was a fairly last minute catastrophic failure of our uh, webinar provider plat <laughs> platform provider. Um, so the aim of this event really is to uh, catalyse the titles of the previous two events. So we've heard um, the regulatory agenda surrounding marine anti-fouling. We've heard how that affects companies. And so this event is really to give you a snapshot of what some of the people in the NBIC and the SNBC community are doing to address those concerns. So the agenda we have, um, I'm going to give this short introduction. Uh, we have the short pictures from five of our industry members, uh, followed by question and answers. If I can ask you to put your questions in the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and questions and answers will be at the end, so submit them at any point, but they will be answered after all the um, short pitches. And then finally, there will be an update on funding options from both MBIC and SNBC that potentially catalyze any ideas you've gained from um, over the course of these three workshops. So I would firstly like to introduce you to uh, Grant Burgess from Newcastle University to talk about his technology in combating marine anti-fouling using biofilm dispersing nucleases. Over to you, Grant. Okay, good morning, folks. Um, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Well, thanks very much to uh, NBIC uh, and Mark for inviting me to present at this uh, webinar today. Uh, I'm really excited to bring to you uh, a story which has been about um, 10 or 15 years in the making uh, and began with our studies of uh, seaweeds, in fact, uh, and we've been looking at combating marine fouling. And I want to focus in this morning on a specific enzyme which we've discovered um, back in 2010 called NUC-B. Uh, it is small 12 kilodalton protein, which is a nuclease, an endonuclease, and it breaks down DNA. Uh, and I'll explain to you why that's relevant to uh, this forum. So <clears throat> this is a beautiful picture of uh, a cell of Escherichia coli, a bacterium which has lysed and broken open. And the stringy stuff that you can see splurging out of the cell is actually DNA, chromosomal DNA. Uh, and I think it shows you the extent of how important this molecule is when a cell dies. And uh, in fouling, when a bacterium sticks to a surface and forms a biofilm, many of the cells within that biofilm will die and they will contribute their extracellular DNA um, to form a, a basically a sticky adhesive, which helps the biofilm to remain um, <clears throat> intact. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a significant literature now which shows that extracellular DNA is indeed a very important component of uh, biofilms, including marine biofilms. So if we know that extracellular DNA is a really important component of biofilms, then what happens when we add an enzyme to break down that DNA? Well, Cynthia Whitchurch uh, showed many years ago that if you add human DNAs or bovine DNAs to biofilms, then they disperse uh, quite amazingly. They, they break up and dissipate and fall off the, sur the surface that they're stuck to. Uh, and we found the same thing uh, using a small uh, nucle nuclease, which is secreted by a marine bacterium that we actually found uh, growing on the surface of a seaweed. And we believe that this bacterium uh, releases nucleases, which do contribute to keeping the surface of the seaweed clean. So by attacking that important structural component of biofilms with a nuclease, we can bring about deliberate and efficient biofilm removal. And this happens at very small concentrations and, and also very quickly. Uh, we realized the, the, the potential of this technology um, when we discovered it in the lab uh, many years ago, uh, and we successfully patented that technology uh, and were awarded uh, a US patent a um, uh, couple of years ago, and the technology is now available for license and is in fact being used to 
uh, stimulate uses of nucleases in, in other markets. So one of our early partners in uh, looking at this technology was Procter & Gamble. So this is a, a world famous, uh, very large uh, consumer goods company that look at, uh, sell a lot of laundry detergents. Uh, we were really excited to announce uh, a few months ago uh, that Procter & Gamble have been able to commercialize this technology into their aerial laundry detergents and have patents uh, to also apply it in, in other areas. So P&G were, were, were quite, they stood out actually because I offered this technology to about uh, 10 companies back in 2008-9 and Procter & Gamble were the first ones to take this on board and work with us to develop it into uh, an optimized enzyme which is trademarked as Purezyme. But basically it's a, a phosphodiesterase, it's a nuclease uh, and uh, Procter & Gamble have been uh, very uh, positive in recognizing the, the contributions of Newcastle University in developing this technology. So we're really excited that this enzyme uh, can be uh, commercialized into uh, large volume applications. Uh, and we would like now to uh, work with uh, colleagues in the uh, marine coatings business who are interested to bring this technology to the marine fouling sector. Sorry, 30 seconds left, Brent. So um, the project began, of course, with marine bacteria, looking at seaweeds. It contributes to keeping seaweeds clean. It's a natural antifoulant, and it's also uh, capable of being produced at low costs upon scale up. And I'd be very pleased to speak to others about working with them to develop this technology further. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Grant. I'll just point out that all these presentations will be made available afterwards um, for people to have a look at contact details and any immediate questions, please, once again, place them down in the Q&A box. So next up, we have uh, Manuel Anselmo from Alvim to talk about his real-time biofilm monitoring technology. So hi, everybody. This is Manuel Anselmo, R&D scientist from Alvim, where we deal with technologies for biofilm monitoring meant expressly for the optimization of cleaning and sanitation treatments. So Alvim is an Italian company. We were born in 2012 out of the collaboration of the Italian National Research Council and some private companies. Despite we are a tiny company, we operate worldwide and we have installations in 30 countries in the five continents. Our patented technology is the result of more than 40 years of both public and private research. Of course, you all know here how does biofilm develop with time, starting from free floating bacteria through the formation of early phase biofilm until biofilm grows and becomes mature. But you also know that the standard approach in the industry is focused on free floating bacteria. But this approach is limited because free floating bacteria represent 10% of the problem because 90% of bacteria live in biofilm instead. And therefore biofilm should be the key performance parameter for microbial control practices in the industry. Also considering that since its earliest phases, biofilm leads to a number of issues starting from corrosion through energy loss until the resistance to antimicrobial treatments. You know, when you apply a biocide treatment to free floating bacteria, these are easily removed, no protection for them. And also young phase biofilms are easily removed. The same is not true though for mature phase biofilms when biocide will only eliminate the outer layer while in the inside bacteria and other pathogens will continue to proliferate. To solve these issues, Alvim developed its biofilm monitoring technologies. As you can see, Alvim probes can be directly inserted in the system where they detect biofilm growth online and in real time, a great advantage. And they detect biofilm as soon as it starts to grow on the sensitive surface of our probe, giving an early warning kind of signal indicating the best time to apply sanitation. The working principle behind our technology is named cathodic depolarization or enoblement. As you can see in any moment, there's a transport of electrons, a kind of electric current from the sensitive surface of the probe to the oxygen in the liquid. Then as soon as biofilm starts to grow on the pipeline, 
and on the sensitive surface of the probe, this electric current is increased. And this is the real bioelectrochemical activity of bacteria. Therefore, our detection is highly specific for biofilm and highly sensitive as well. And this technology can be highly useful in a number of industrial sectors, starting from cooling waters to food and beverage, oil and gas, all the sectors you can see here where Alvim already operates since many years with the key industrial players worldwide. But since this is the topic today, Alvim technology is also useful in marine environments, for example, to extend the lifetime of underwater equipment, to monitor microbiological growth on board of ships in cooling systems, and to safeguard oceanographic sensors, for example. And this Technology has been applied in a number of international research projects, like those you can see in these slides. For example, dealing with corrosion control for Navy ships or for safeguarding uh, oceanographic sensors. These research projects and many others were developed with many international partners, such as Ephraimer, Naval Group, the University of Portsmouth and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In case you want to find out more about our technology, do not hesitate contacting us or visiting our website. So thank you for your attention, everybody. That's excellent. Thank you, Manuel. So next up is Marcus Hoffman of iTech to talk about a uh, anti-fouling solution. Hello, um, yeah, my name is Max Hoffman and I present a little bit of iTech and what we did and uh, who we are. Um, and we have a product mainly against barnacles. So iTech as a company, we are a Swedish company. We are located in Gothenburg within a bioventure hub from, from AstraZeneca. We are a stock listed company. We went to Nasdaq Nord uh, some, 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 some years ago and our team is around 10 people and we are located in four countries. So small, but quite international and we already have sales of around 5 million euros and uh, uh, growing at the rate of around 30%. Just some uh, background because uh, this might be interesting in, in, in this forum. So Sorry, Marcus, are you, are you um, working off a presentation right now? Because um, we can't see anything. You can't see anything? Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> okay, what's now going? There you go. No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Sorry for that. Okay. Okay, you can see it now? Yeah. I hope so. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so we are stock listed, a small team of 10, uh, uh, 10 people uh, and around 5 million euro turnover. Um, milestones yeah, could be interesting in, in, in this forum. Um, yeah, so the, comp the academic work was done in the 90s. The company was founded in, uh, in the year 2000. Um, and the first real sale started in 2014. And um, the company is now cash positive, but it, you can see it's around 20 years from the start to today where we are cash positive. So it's uh, bringing a new biocide into the market is, is a long process and you have a lot of hurdles, especially uh, registration and approval. Um, the challenge of, uh, of anti-foulings, so we saw about the biofilms, uh, our target is uh, the barnacles, there are mainly three um, things, so, so uh, invasive aquatic species, so uh, it's more and more becoming a problem that uh, yeah, invasive species uh, are of, of concern and that has to be battled and the IMO has taken action already with the uh, water ballast treatment. Uh, exhaust uh, gas emissions, so CO carbon dioxide and also SOx, NOx. Um, the, the, the global fleet of, of shipping is around three percent of the total emissions, and just by changing the better anti-fouling, one could save the emissions of, uh, of of Denmark, for example. And for the ship owner, um, just by going to better um, products and fouling, you can easily save up to ten to fifteen billions of of fuel sales. And here there's a study which is known in, uh, in our industry uh, from the Office of Naval Res uh, Research from the US Navy, that if you have 10% of binary coverage on, on your vessel, you get at 15 knots on, on, uh, on, on a frigate, 36% increase of fuel consumption. So the impact of binary fouling on a vessel is quite big. So what's our approach for, for the binary fouling? 
That's a, a separate lobby uh, before settling. That's the Senecal or Metitomidin, uh, which is also used in, in other anesthetics. And this is in a nutshell how it looks. So you here have a coating without selectope, and here you have a, a coating with selectope. Here you can see a lot of barnacles, and here you see it's barnacle free. Um, yeah. Um, very often the biocytes in, uh, in antifoundings are not very well described, or it's not very clear the, the mechanism on the molecular level. So um, selectope binds to an octop oct um, octopamine receptor, which is a G-coupled uh, receptor. Uh, but simply on the receptor. This is the pocket, which is well described for metomidine. And what it does, it increases the, the, barn, the, larvae, the barnacle larvae. They, when they swim around before settling, they swim and it, it speeds up the kicking of the legs when, when, when the selector binds to the pocket. Um, what, what's the difference? So there are other biocytes uh, proven, uh, biocytes like the cuprous oxide and others. Um, selectope is very um, specific, so you need around two grams per liter of paint, while you need another paints, uh, other biocytes, you need up to 800 grams of, of a biocyte. So this gives a lot of new options for the formulations. And the working mechanism, um, the atom barnacle releases larvae, so you start the nuclear larvae, uh, this one uh, grow for some weeks, they convert into the separate larvae, and this one then starts of settling. And what selectope does, it prevents the separate larvae from settling, so it gets into contact with the selectope. The, um, these start swimming very excited, so the, the legs kick very fast and then can't settle. The advantage is, or one of the advantages is uh, that you probably will not get any resistance because it's not killing um, the organism, it's just preventing it from, from, from settling. And after two, three hours, the selectope is digested and, and the separate larvae go back into, into normal mode. From, uh, from a paint uh, perspective, so antifoulings are paints which slowly dissolve, polish off into, um, into, into seawater. And um, yeah, so the biocide, the red dots come out of the, um, of the, of the paint film. Like 30 um, seconds, and, Marcus. Yeah, so, and, and what I just want to say is um, Selector also gives you the uh, opportunity to, as a tool, also to work on better algae and slime production if, if you change the way of formulation. Yeah, and that's it, what I wanted to present. That's brilliant, thank you very much. So again, if anyone has any questions for any of the, the speakers or panelists today, um, please drop them down in the Q&A box. Uh, if I can now pass over to Kang Meng, who can introduce the speakers from Singapore. Thank you, Will. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Professor Ali Mizeres from the Nanyang Technological University. His presentation will be on slips, slippery liquid infused surfaces coatings as biocide free marine antifouling coatings. Um, Professor Ali. Yeah, thank you. Let me just share my screen. There we go. Can you see it? Yep. Yep. Okay. So uh, the good thing is there was a lot of introduction about the um, biofouling in general, so I don't need to go into this and I can go straight into business, if I may say. <laughs> So we are, we're based in Singapore, right? Myself and Serena, which, who will talk after me. Um, so um, there's a lot of uh, fouling in the tropic. It's actually kind of an ideal environment to, uh, to study fouling. And then we've been mostly looking into uh, the green muscle. We also do work on barnacles, but the green or the muscle is kind of our model system to understand biofouling. Um, so I think I don't need to explain all this concept here, but this is basically, you know, the muscle is probably one of the, the heavier uh, macrophile organism. So the, this, this uh, specific work, uh, this is something we started uh, for marine biofiling with the lab of uh, Joanna Eisenberg at Harvard. And so uh, she, they invented this concept of slip, uh, slippery liquid infused porous surface, which basically you have a functional texture solid and then you introduce a lubricating film. And this film basically form uh, immiscible lubricant overlayer on the surface. Uh, and then so one, one of the key uh, thing here is to have a very low interfascial energy between the substrate and this lubricant. And so because you have this, uh, this basically liquid overlayer, it's actually very efficient at preventing a whole bunch of uh, phenomena. So it's antibacterial, anti-icing, et cetera. So when we started this, uh, I, 
suggested to uh, uh, Joanna we should try marine biofouling. And so uh, what I'm just what I'll be showing today is basically two type of coating, what we call the academic slip. So that's the one we work in the lab. Uh, in, uh, and it's fairly simple. Which basically, you have a PDMS uh, substrate, and then you uh, introduce the lubricant. Uh, it can be uh, synthetic lubricant, but the one we've developed here at NTU is a uh, is a bio lubricant. And then there is a. Uh, this is the work that we've been collaborating with uh, Adaptive Surface Technology, which is the spin-off from Harvard. And so we've been working with them, doing all the tests. Uh, here in Singapore. I believe Serena maybe also has, has done some tests herself. Um, so I'll just show you briefly the way it works. Uh, I mean, I won't go into the detail here, but basically what we were doing here uh, to start is we had uh, what we call a check checkerboard pattern with all different kinds of coating. And we were looking at how the muscles settle and whether they secrete their, their, their basal thread, the thread that they use to stick on surfaces. And so it's a bit busy here, but what you want to see really is here on the right, and you could see this is this surface here. Uh, you could see that it was way lower than the, the, the control, or just, this is some other uh, commercial coding. And so uh, basically, the, the, the infused surface, they're, they're basically rejected by the muscles. Uh, there's a lot of details in this paper if you're interested to understand the mechanism. And just to show the other, the other example showing that this is a very good identity filing is that the adhesion energy or the adhesion strength, sorry, of those threads is very low. So here what we've done is when the, the muscle, they secrete a thread, uh, we develop a little tensile testing system and we pull on those threads, you can see it here, and then you can see that the adhesion strength is very low for one thread. So it means that to remove the whole, uh, the whole muscle, it will be much easier because the, uh, the adhesion strength of the, of the whole animal is way weaker. So that was in the lab. And of course, these days, when uh, you want to show that the anti-filing system works, you have to do uh, in, the, in, the, in the field. So this was the work that they've done. Uh, that was in the US, in uh, near Boston. And so this is uh, just after 16 weeks in that case, where there was almost no filing. Now, all of this was done, of course, in a temperate environment. And then in, uh, if you're in Singapore or in a tropical environment, uh, the filing is much faster, much more aggressive. So uh, starting from that, then what we've been doing uh, in the past few years is basically we wanted to replace the silicone oil to have something which is completely a biolubricant. And so we replace the silicone with oleic acid or methyl oleate. And the idea is that the surface energy of this uh, lubricant is very close to the substrate again. So what you see here, those are basically fluorescent uh, image. Uh, and then basically you can see that especially this uh, methyl oleate, it's very, um, it's very uniform, the film. If you see here, it's kind of patchy for the uh, oleic acid, so it's not as efficient. And then what we found is that if you have a very um, uniform film of this biolubricant, then the uh, anti-filing efficiency is, is better. So we did the same kind of tests we showed earlier. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a bit busy here, but all what you want to, to uh, find here is that's very important, of course, as there is no cytotoxicity. And so what we did here was basically to take a fish gill cell lines and check the cytotoxicity of those coatings. Because of course, uh, if you want to claim that it's, uh, uh, it's uh, not a biocide, you have to prove it. And basically we could see that it was non-toxic uh, to uh, those kind of cells. So those, those cells are kind of a proxy for uh, toxicity, potential toxicity. And this is the file release efficiency. That's the same assay that we developed for the other, the other example I showed you earlier. And so you can see on the right here that basically it's not as good as the, the what I call the IPDMS, the, 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 uh, the one based on, uh, on silicone, but it's, it's, it's approaching. And the difference of course, is that it's made of completely of biolubricant. So this is the work that we did uh, with, uh, with a different kind of biolubricant. And then uh, further on after that, we've been working with, uh, with AST, Adaptive Surface Technology. And in that case, basically the lubricant is already incorporated inside the formulation. It's a two component system. It's very simple to, um, to apply. So the first, uh, one of the first thing we did, of course, is verifying that uh, those coatings are not toxic to, again, the fish gill cell line, and that was the case. Um, and then we, we checked in the field. So this is in, uh, in what I call static water conditions. So that's basically a muscle farm. 
And so when you look at this uh, after 100 days, it seems like the muscle are, have been colonized, those coating. But actually, if you start looking then some video showing the process. So on the left one, this is only the, the Thai code. Then the middle is the, uh, the lab version. And then the third one here is what comes from the, the company. So I just start a video here. So here it's almost impossible to remove everything. Of course, it's heavily fouled. And I show you the middle here where um, it's much easier. So basically the, the muscle didn't really stick. There's some barnacle though, as opposed to what we saw in the previous talk. And then, okay, I can stop this one. And then this is the one from AST here after 190 days. And you will see when we try to remove the, the muscle, it, it just very easily removed, which would be much more difficult otherwise. You can see here. So the, the muscle basically didn't really attach. They kind of go around the, the coating, but it's very simple to remove. So that's in static water condition. And so you can see here after you clean it, basically, uh, this is the different kind of SM, SNSC are the different coating that they've developed in the company. So it's fairly easy to remove everything. Uh, and of course, if you take, if you don't have, uh, if you only have the Thai code, it's much more, much more difficult. And then the other kind of testing we did was uh, under hydrodynamic forces. And so the way we did this is we placed those panel in a high tide current location. So it's, you kind of have a auto cleaning system. So this is, Kind of simulate a moving vessel and so you can see here after 150 days this is the coating from the, the company here and you just basically if you rub your finger over the um the film here it just comes off very very simply very easily so uh, if you use a water jet you'd be able to remove everything basically very 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 easily so this is uh basically the work that we've been doing on those uh, on the slippery surface and so basically, they are, they're very good at uh, anti fouling coding. The, the academic coding, as I call them, they work very well in the lab. And now we understand fairly well, at, at least for the muscle, why they don't like to stick on the surfaces. Uh, there is more development ongoing. And then the, the company coating from AST, they actually work almost as good as the academic coating, but they can be applied in larger scale area. Uh, and so in, in, in Singapore water, which is highly aggressive, they also work quite well. Uh, and so the, we are currently exploring a different uh, offshore application at the moment. And just to acknowledgement, so this is the people who did the work, uh, collaborator, uh, Hugh Allen Hugh, uh, Scott Rice, uh, the collaborator in biofiling, Eisenberg's lab at Harvard. And then uh, this was actually funded by the National Research Foundation here, the Marine Science Research and Development Program. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I hope I'm on time. Thank you, Prof Ali. Um, the last speaker today is Dr. Serena Teo, who is the Facility Director of St. John's Island National Mar Marine Lab, who will be talking about the St. John's uh, Island Lab for marine antifouling and biofilm research. Dr. Teo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let me try and share. Uh, okay, okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yes? Yes. Okay, um, so my job is much easier now that I think you've had three sessions of people convincing you that you can do biofouling research and it's a fun thing to do. And so my job is very simple. I just need to convince you that Singapore is the best place on the planet to do this research. I think uh, Ali started that process already, right? Uh, so as you know, there are about what, thousand ships at any moment in time in Singapore, which means that the whole uh, shipping industry is here. And if you think about the biofouling community, I mean, what is there not to love about the biofouling community in Singapore? It is diverse and colorful. And this picture here on the left side where you see all that sea fans and corals, this is only three years old. So things move very fast in Singapore. Um, just to share with you some of the work that we've been doing under the uh, U.S. Navy program. Um, our test site actually has about 15 years baseline data. So as far as um, benchmarking to all the conventional commercial coatings that are out there, baseline data exists. Um, in a study uh, conducted by the Navy in the 2000, um, Singapore and India has about one of the highest rates. 
And I would say that, yes, especially for you who are working in the biofilms community, uh, we have a lot of biofilms. Uh, and I would say it is even more so now in the next few months, uh, I've just been informed that La Nina has started. And one of the things about La Nina, of course, is that, well, the biofouling community is going to be dominated by awesome slimes. Um, I think that if you are looking at working with biofilms in Singapore, it's uh, important to know that communities are very heterogeneous um, and very diverse. In general, for people working with biofilms, I would say that your work is finished in about three to six days. Uh, normally around day four or five, um, the hard fowlers will start to settle. So unless you actually put in filters to prevent uh, settlement of macrofouling, um, most of the biofilms work will be done within a week. Uh, most biofilms, as long as there's sunlight, um, there will be a, a lot of slime, which is quite a bit of benthic algae on the surface. And in general, uh, most effects relying on surface charges and wettability don't work so well because of these heavy slimes. Um, so right now, uh, I'd like to share with you our facilities, which we have been developing at the National Marine Lab. Um, the first thing to share is that uh, this facility is actually open to anyone to use, right? Whether you're from industry, academia, or even if you're overseas, right? You just need to write in and then you can access the facilities. And because I'm the facility director, I'm, I'm biased towards anti-fouling. Uh, many of our facilities actually are good for people working in biofouling. Uh, and as I said, uh, we have a lot of facilities to study films and Howling. Um, where is the marine lab? For those of you in Singapore who haven't visited me yet, uh, the marine station is at St. John's Island. Where is St. John's Island? St. John's Island is on the southernmost point of Singapore and uh, we're located right adjacent to the Sisters Island Marine Park. Um, so whether you are looking for biofilms or natural habitats in the aquarium system or something you want to create indoors, uh, it's entirely possible. Uh, we also have now a seawater flume. Um, and that is, I think, maybe very important now as we look at the, these new next generation surfaces, because I think that uh, many of the foul release surfaces, um, we probably should give up our uh, traditional ways of testing them with water jet and barnacle adhesion. Um, there is a lot of need now to study films in flow. Um, we also have quite a good um, larval culture facility um, to make it easier. I think for many people, especially those of you out there who work on polymers, um, it may not be so easy that you also become a good aquaculturist in culture barnacles. So you actually can come to the lab and uh, obtain organisms and run your experiments on site. Uh, my technician has been working on biofouling for a long time, so she knows everything you need to know about running an assay. Uh, there are also a lot of facilities um, for bioimaging because, of course, we have a lot of people doing biology, so there is a new confocal. Um, there is also a laser-free optical sectioning microscope, cell sorters, flow cam, as usual now, molecular biology is the main tool that's being used for analysis of biofilms. Um, and you should be able to do the entire extraction process for DNA on site, um, as well as the usual chemistry equipment. Um, and so I, if you're interested to do research in Singapore, all you need to do is um, you can have a look at our website or you can also email me and I would be able to help you uh, figure out whether or not your work can be done at St. John's. Okay, thank you. And I hope you'll come and join us. Thank you, Dr. Teo. Uh, we will now go to my favorite session, the Q&A, which will be led by Tom. Tom? Thanks very much to all the um, contributors today. A really interesting whistle-stop tour through uh, biofilm and uh, biofouling prevention technology. So thank you all for that. Um, so I've got some questions. Um, I'm going to start off with a question for Manuel. 
And thanks very much for your, your talk on the biofilm protection. Very interesting ability to detect biofilms um, in, in real time. Um, can you tell me, so from a marine perspective, um, what would be really interesting is understanding biofilm development relative to a protective anti-fouling coating. So not just the um, abundance of, like of the biofilm on the, on the surface of the sensor, but how that relates to biofilm buildup on that an active Putin. Thank you. Does that sense to have the capability to do that? Thank you for your question. It was a pleasure to present today. And if I can quickly elaborate on that, a contribution which can come out of our technology is, for example, at research level. So when there is in the stage of development of anti-folding coatings, for example, or similar technologies, usually these are done in, 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 in the lab or on the field, and it is also use, it is always useful to know the biological pressure there is in the lab system, in the marine system, and therefore monitoring biofilm growth with our technology is one additional info you can get, and therefore it can help developing the coating, knowing if the biological pressure was high, for example, or if it wasn't. In the last talk, we have seen a huge biological pressure presented, but in some cases, maybe it takes more time for biofilm to grow and then for macrofouling to grow after that. And this is one contribution. Also, as I showed, our technology was deployed for extending the lifetime of underwater equipment. And so this was done in the field or to prevent microbiological growth on board where seawater is used for example. So this, this technology, which is mainly used in the industry, can be applied in a number of applications also with this respect. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I think so. So it's more about characterizing the, the sort of biofilm um, fouling challenge, the context of, of that. that yes, getting more, getting more info, that's always useful, of course. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Manuel. That was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, next question for Serena. Um, Serena, thanks very much for giving us a tour of your facilities. Um, I have to say, uh, as a fan of biofouling assemblages myself, they, they look beautiful. So um, yeah, it looks like a great place to do some work. Tell me, I, I run a test centre as well, um, and I'm sure you've got a lot more experience than, um, in terms of um, yeah, using that site to characterise coatings. But can you tell me, um, have you got any plans for dynamic testing facilities there in terms of simulating um, vessel speeds, duty cycles, that kind of thing. I saw the flume tank was there, but if you've got anything um, that gets yeah, closer to how a vessel might operate. So that is something that uh, we are actually very interested to do. And uh, I am looking at a potential plan in the next five years to actually uh, obtain some seafront space. Um, one of our challenges with dynamic testing, I guess, is that the capacity of these um, facilities would normally be able to accommodate about 100, 200 uh, panels. And so it's actually quite important that um, we have enough people who are willing to do participate in dynamic testing. And that's where my concern lies because of course, for many paint companies, uh, the concept of sharing uh, a test facility may be uneasy because the competition between them is quite fierce. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I am still watchful whether our uh, scientists are ready to do panel tests, right? Most of the local scientists, I think, are not at that stage where they can really look at big uh, tests. But having said that, if you're just doing uh, biofilms, uh, it's quite simple to set up a simple uh, raceway test. Uh, our facility pumps a lot of seawater, much more than we ever need. So it's, it's quite simple actually to set up a simple raceway where you can uh, do films. And as I said, most of those biofilms will develop within three to six days. So that should be quite easy. Um, I just want to quickly address Colin's question. How do you prevent rapid growth of fouling in your flume? Uh, Colin, we don't leave it on if nobody's doing any work in it, so it should be dry and clean. <laughs> uh, but yes, if you're running an experiment, you do have to clean back the flume regularly. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Serena. 
Um, I've got some plans for um, expanding our dynamic test facilities, and which um, so I might, might have a chat with you offline, and uh, we can do yes. yes, more resources. Sure. Okay. That sounds great. Um, okay, uh, next question for um, Professor Ali. Um, thank you very much for introducing your um, technology you're working on. Just a question about how the system is, is actually constructed. Can you tell us how you introduce the porosity into that EDMS layer? Okay, so actually a PDMS is a, it's a network, right? It's a polymer network. So it's kind of in, inherently uh, porous at the, at the nanoscale. And, and then uh, it means that if you just put the, uh, the, the lubricant, provided it has a very uh, interfacial or surface energy, which is close enough to PDMS, it will spontaneously uh, infiltrate the network. That's, that's, I mean, I didn't invent anything here, right? I want to make it sure this is the, the, the technology was, uh, was from uh, Johan Eisenberg's lab at Harvard, uh, but we use it for biofiling. So it's actually uh, fairly simple in a sense, at least the first generation. Uh, and then for the company, of course, this works fine in a lab, but for a company, it's more complicated. So I think in that case, uh, they basically incorporate inside their formulation, the lubricants. Uh, I don't know the detail exactly because they, they pass it to us and then we, we apply it. And then uh, it's already in, inside the formulation, but that's the way it works there. So it's uh, it's fairly simple in that case as well. And then also it's um, uh, there's there's a kind of self replenishing because let's see someone has the question. It's kind of follow up on this. There is there is enough of it that over time the the lubricant which is inside the coating will come over the surface. So that's enough for at least a few years uh, of the of the emissible film. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. For that. And I guess um, yeah, a few questions coming in are, are on this topic. Have you got any information about the sort of mechanical resistance of the systems? I guess you know, in terms of using it in in application in, in uh, most marine um, settings, the, the mechanical resistance can be quite important. Have you got any data describing that yet, or, or not yet? I mean, there were the, the the especially the one from the company. We kept them for up to almost six months, and it was not too bad. And when we removed the film. Um, there was no like delamination or something, but we haven't really tested, you know, in all detail. We, we measured the, the modulus, you know, the, the elastic modulus before and after in the field, uh, but we haven't done, haven't done like the detailed analysis. Uh, but it, I have to say, when, when you put it in this very heavy fouling environment and then you, uh, you, you pull off the, those muscle and stuff, it, was, it looked pretty, uh, pretty stable. Okay, sounds good. Well, promising, yeah, we'll watch that space and sounds good. Thank you. Um, okay, next question for uh, Professor Burgess. Um, thanks very much for introducing your um, your technology and some some beautiful uh, images there of those live cells. And that's just um, yeah, it's quite incredible stuff. Can you tell us? Have you? I realise obviously that your your request here is to start partnering with coating manufacturers. Have you thought anything of, um, much about the sort of liberal potential delivery mechanism of your technology within a sort of traditional coating matrix? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, I think it's probably going to be, I mean, I'm not a coatings expert, um, but it's probably going to be something similar to the, the leaching um, or that's been described in some other presentations this morning. Um, you know, when you immobilize an enzyme, it massively increases its stability. Um, there will be an element of leaching. Um, and that's exactly the project that I, you know, I'd be interested in, in developing further. Um, you know, the exact mechanisms of immobilizing these enzymes. The interesting thing about this bacterial enzyme is it's very um, stable. It's almost as if it evolved to work in seawater. You know, it's secreted by a bacterium. The bacterium lives on a seaweed. Uh, and it's actually, uh, when we published the x-ray crystal structure of the enzyme, we found that it was actually a novel enzyme, first in class of that particular uh, enzyme class so it's not like other nucleases um, and, and we believe therefore those properties the small size the stability the thermal stability uh, would make it uh, a very good candidate for doing those uh, immobilization studies with that's good thank you very much okay um question for marcus uh, marcus thanks very much for describing how um how your technology stimulates the, the swimming of the cyprid larvae. Can you tell us, have you got any information about um, how the compound works against other members of a fouling assemblage, obviously, you know, especially yeah. if you went to Singapore, you'd have a, a, fair, a fair suite of species to be working against. Have you got any data on 
yeah. 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 we, we, we know that it works against the two forms. And uh, there's another species I can't tell you because uh, that has not been uh, validated totally. But we know that it works against tube worms. But one uh, challenge we have is um, a lot of people work on barnacles. So you find barnacle labs, but uh, not too many people work really on a molecular level on, on tube worms. So, so we'd be quite happy to, <laughs> to work with somebody who's working on tube worms in a more uh, scientific way. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Sounds good. Okay. Um, Right, well, I think that's most of the questions we've got at the moment. What I think I'll do now is I'm going to hand back to Will to describe some of the um, potential funding mechanisms we've got coming up. Um, and Ted, I think we've got a chance for a few questions on those as well. So if anyone's got any questions about the potential for funding, um, we can address those too. So thanks very much for all the panellists. And um, yeah, I'm going to hand back to Will. Excellent. Thanks very much, Tom. I shall just start sharing my screen. Great. So um, one of the main objectives we had of, of running this um, webinar series is to form some projects between our members um, for, for new and novel ideas around marine anti-fouling. And a way that we have to support that is through our proof of concept grants. Um, and this is just the, the MBIC side. Uh, I'll hand over to Stefan Kilberg in, in a moment to give some of the information about the, the Singapore funding side. So a brief explanation is what our, our proof of concept uh, grants are. They're um, kind of initial kind of TRL level two to four, if you're familiar with technology readiness level. Um, if you're not, that's really, you've got some, perhaps some lab-based work that shows that, you know, a, a novel idea you have for anti-fouling might work, but you don't have any real world data. Um, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for. So the projects are around six months. We fund on average between 25 and 50K per project. They're formed with a um, UK-based company and a UK-based academic institution. It doesn't have to be a university. It can be a research institution as well. Um, and further details can be found on our website, but uh, they, we have a new one coming up, which will open on the 4th of January and close on the, the 12th of February. So while uh, the application form itself isn't available right now, as it doesn't open until January, if anyone has any questions about um, whether their project would be relevant or asking us for help in finding partners ready for the application opening, we'd be more than happy to review anything you send through. Um, yes, and it's all online application and it's assessed by an independent industry and academic assessment teams. So yes, if you have any questions about this, please put them down in the Q&A box or go on our website and send them directly to us. Um, and I'll hand over now to uh, Stefan to talk about some of the funding opportunities available for SCLC and SMBC. Thank you. Thanks, Will. So similar to, um, to NBIC, uh, SNBC, uh, Singapore National Biofilm Consortium, also has a seed grant program for um, industry and academic research collaboration and uh, with similar objectives um, as for, for NBIC. So we are there to promote small scale collaborative proof of concept uh, and um, other development projects and across universities and research institutes, uh, polytechnics, so it can be a broad uh, range of, of research organizations and, and then industry members, SMBC industry members. And the idea is to, to get to the point where we, we, we have uh, um, some proof of concept uh, that it is sort of then is a basis for research uh, with the um, research organizations itself, uh, perhaps uh, also within the company or it can be taken to larger scale uh, applications. So there's a system in Singapore for larger scale academic industry applications based on having uh, uh, made sort of the, the, first, sort of the first steps. And, and any academic really is eligible to be part of this. Um, so apply to be a member of, of SNBC as an academic. And there can be faculty members, there can be PIs, there can be research fellows. And, they can, and then in that capacity as being a member of SNBC, as a PI, apply for um, such a seed grant uh, with 
a, an industry member, so a, a new, a, an existing or, or a, a new uh, industry member uh, of SNBC. So we are right now um, uh, open for uh, towards the end effect of the second call. So we had one call earlier in the year. So second call that is open for applications and the closing date is, is soon, as you can see here, the 30th of November. Uh, so if you are interested, if anyone is uh, as a PI and, and a um, industrial partner who may want to join um, SNBC and, and, uh, and collaborate uh, and think that they can do so within a reasonably short period of time, contact us by all means and, and we will see how we can accommodate uh, that closing date uh, in that particular case if you are sort of uh, interested. So please contact uh, smitha.vs at ntu.edu sg for more details we haven't gone live yet with uh, the website for for SNBC very shortly too but uh, please contact smitha.vs at ntu.edu.sg for, for more details you can also go of course to, to the CELSI website to, to look at the, the research platform more, more broadly on biofilms and, and microbiomes the next call the third call is planned for mid uh, mid next next year so along similar lines to, to NBIC. And in fact, indeed, we, we, we are in discussions between um, SNBC and, and NBIC to, to figure out whether we can, uh, in some, some way, uh, join activities and then have larger research collaboration and industrial collaboration across the two, uh, the two organizations. So then finally, um, uh, on behalf of all of us, of the organizers, uh, that is NBIC uh, and PML, CELSI and SNBC, uh, and also the Singapore Working Group on Antifouling. We would like to um, express our thanks to all the speakers and the participants who have taken part in, in, in this marine biofouling series that we have run now in three sessions, where we addressed uh, in the first session the regulatory framework and then addressed um, the challenges and opportunities from an industry perspective. And now we had pitches on innovations for future marine biofilm and biofarming control in today's presentations. And we've had um, in the order of 60 participants from 15 countries um, um, at each of these events, uh, plus uh, many recording requests from others from regions where the time zones did not quite match. Um, obviously, there will, there will be, be such. And so we are very pleased that we've had a, a good mix of participants from both industry and and academia, as well as other research organizations and other research communities. And this um, aligns really well with the ambitions, the R&D ambitions that we've had across SNBC and CELSI and BIC and, and PML. So we really appreciate your interest um, and, and we hope that we will be able to continue this momentum. So we are planning now for additional thematic webinars that are based on on an understanding of microbial biofilms and, and microbiomes. So we, we, we would love to, of course, to hear from you with your feedback on, on the series we have run and also suggestions that you may have for other such R&D domains um, of biofilms and microbiomes and their um, translation and opportunities. Uh, and, and that would be really so sort of good to, to, see you, to hear your views so, so we can be beneficial uh, for, for discussions with a broader community going forward. And I believe that we will circulate the link this week to all of you who have been participating uh, for that kind of, of follow-up. So, so, so please uh, respond and please uh, um, present your ideas and, and, uh, and that will give us sort of a good measure of, of in, in which direction we should take for the next phase. So um, with that then, um, again, many thanks for your interest and participation broadly over the last uh, three sessions. And, and we really hope that we will be in, in, in contact, uh, contact soon. So with that, uh, uh, Will and, and Tom, if there are no further uh, additional um, uh, information to, to add, uh, we, we hope to be in contact soon and, 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 uh, and hear and see from you soon. So, so with that, uh, bye for now. <laughs>